One of the major talking points against the GDR is its supposed lack of democracy. A common phrase is, quote, if it has democratic in the name, it clearly means it isn't. This is a huge underestimation of how the GDR actually ran as a society and clearly shows an ignorance towards it. Yes, democracy in the GDR was nothing like that in the West. But this isn't exactly a negative thing, as it never actually aimed to emulate the West in their dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. This was the workers and peasants state, and as a result we need to understand how a different type of democracy functioned, socialist democracy. General Secretary of the Socialist Unity Party, or the SED, Elish Honecker, described it by saying, quote, Socialist democracy demands political and social activity from everybody and promotes active behaviour on the part of everybody, unquote. In practice, this meant the politicisation and raising of class consciousness in every part of society. This was put into practice during the 1968 mass discussions on the GDR's new constitution. Unlike the West, the GDR put the new constitution up for a public debate. Data from the Thuringia Berserk shows that 57%, or 716,077 people to be exact, um, had taken part in constitutional debates within the first week of them commencing. The constitution affirmed the right to work, the right to housing, the right to education and the freedom of religion. The debates were broadcast all, the, all across the country, printed in the press and occurred across society. Because of how involved the people were in these debates, the constitution was accepted by 95% of the population in a public vote and set the GDR firmly on the path of socialism. With that laid out, let's take a look at the makeup of the Volkskammer or the People's Chamber and the GDR's government. There existed in the GDR several parties, with some having direct Western equivalents. These being the Christian Democratic Union, to represent Christians in society, the Liberal Democratic Party for small business owners, which did exist, the National Democratic Party for ex-Fehrmark soldiers and rehabilitated Nazis, and the Democratic Farmers Party for farmers and peasants. However, everyone knew that true power lay with the SED as the main Marxist-Leninist party and represented, rep representative of Germany's working class. These parties functioned together in a government called the National Front. All the parties, therefore, worked together for the common goal of building socialism in the GDR and could represent their various support bases in the decision-making process. The lack of a formal opposition is also commonly brought up to denounce the GDR, and in response to that, um, I'll quote first General Secretary of the SED, Walter Ulbricht, who had this to say about it, quote, Some citizens ask why we have no opposition, and think that an opposition is part of a real democracy. But democracy does not reign where various parties act against each other, where the power of the working class is divided and an opposition exists. After all, an opposition in the GDR could be directed only against the policy of our government. It would therefore have to be directed against the introduction of the 45-hour work week, against the construction of an additional 100,000 apartments, against our low rents, against the stability of our prices, against the machine tractor stations, against the high expenditure on science and culture, against our peace policy. It would have to be directed against the unity of the working class, against our workers and peasants state. It would have to be in favour of employing militarists and fascists in high positions of power, of the NATO war pact and of preparations for a nuclear war. Tolerating such an opposition would be criminal." Unquote. However, parties only actually made up two thirds of the seats in the Volkskammer. The remaining third was taken up by the mass organisations, consisting of the Free German Trade Union to represent the workers, the Democratic German Women's Association to represent women, the Free German Youth for, the, for young people and the Culture League for the intellectuals. There were 56,000 of these organisations in the GDR, but these were the only ones to actually get representation in the Volkskammer as they were the largest and represented the broadest range in society. In fact, one in six people was a member of at least one of these organisations. So again, society was overwhelming, overwhelmingly represented by these organisations in Parliament. Now, obviously the question remains, how do people actually get into the Volkskammer? Well, of course, the answer is an election. They were usually um, every four years and naturally have their own set of misinformation attached to them. The 99% approval ratings really do need a little bit of context here. 
Uh, so the candidates were selected by party members or members of the mass organisations and were put forward after extensive debate and discussion. Um, the discussion also involved community members and the candidates were decided by the attendees voting. Elections therefore served as the final formality in the process of democratic centralism, an opportunity for the people to approve or disprove of the candidates put forward in the debate that was had. They could cross out any names they didn't like and uh, submit it into the ballot box. Um, the turnout rates uh, also rank unusually high, usually in the high 90%, showing a willingness of the people to engage with politics and combating that myth of an apathetic society. At first, this could sound a little bit cliquey. Small groups of party members setting up lists for the people to blindly follow. And this might be a valid concern if party membership was small, but in reality, it was exceptionally high. The SED alone had 2,260,979 members in 1989, representing roughly one in eight of the population, with the bloc parties ranking at roughly 100,000 between each other. Party members were also seen as community leaders, whether it was in their workplace, a society or a housing bloc. It was their responsibility to represent their community in, the, in these debates for candidates. However, this does not mean that the system was without any faults. The whole system ref rested on these mass discussions between the party members and the people. But by the 1980s, it's very clear that these discussions were starting to lack in character and most likely led to a mass apathy in the GDR as people felt their voice was no longer being heard. From this, we can learn that socialism requires a mass line to connect the people and the state and to combat dogmatism so that true socialist democracy can flourish. However, democracy was not just confined to the Volkskammer, as the GDR put questions of social policy directly to the people. The greatest example of this was the 1965 referendum on the family law, which saw 33,973 meetings taking place across the entirety of the country. This resulted in 23,737 specific suggestions being put forward for debate. Around half of these were then considered by the Volkskammer and resulted in around 230 final amendments to the original bill. A similar process also took place with the 1974 youth law and it shows how ordinary people had their say on how the country was run. This being said, as mentioned earlier, it is clear that by the 1980s dogmatism was firmly set in and there were less of these mass discussions, perhaps being another reason for the GDR's collapse in 1990. Um, socialist democracy was also a feature of everyday life in the GDR, with the use of Eingarben, or citizens' communications. The district council of Klutzer reported in 1966 that the role of Eingarben was, quote, improving the working and living conditions of people, as well as deepening the relationship between citizens and their state, unquote. This allowed any citizen to submit complaints to any official in the GDR, from the lowest factory foreman all the way up to the likes of Ulbricht and Honecker. Honecker himself actually received 100,000 of these Eingarben in 1988 alone, and by law every single one required a response within four weeks and the utmost effort put in to resolve the problem. However, most Eingarben were actually submitted to a committee of volunteers who dealt with ordinary issues such as housing repairs, long queue times for commodities such as trabants, as well as much more serious issues like workplace grievances and more constitutional problems. This was seen as a vital process by citizen and state, as it, es as it is estimated that half of all adults and two thirds of households have submitted at least one Eingarben, and the state published regular reports on their success rate of fulfilling these demands. The mass amounts of Eingarben shows that the people were willing to engage with socialist democracy and work at improving everyday life, whilst the state also saw them as an essential aspect of maintaining that crucial link between the people and the party and keeping in touch with the mood of the masses. To conclude, we can see that socialist democracy involved and depended on the people engaging with politics in their daily lives, as well as on election day. It involved far more than ticking a box every four years, as we know in the West. It meant that people had an active say um, in how their lives were run and there was an active connection between the people and the party so that the unity of the masses was maintained and this was the key to making revolutionary change in society. To creating a society that was in work, housed and educated. But the lessons we must learn from the GDR are how socialist democracy can potentially stagnate when the unity of the people and the state is broken. An ageing leadership and complacency only leads to alienation and later revolution. 
Therefore, we must uphold the GDR's democratic system, but recognise the need for a mass line to make sure socialist democracy is truly a system for the people and by the people. With that being said, the next video will cover the socialist workplace, looking at how a community of work was formed in the GDR, the mass industrialisation at the end of the war, the front against unemployment, and the democracy that was a constant feature in the workplace, and how workers self-organise for the defence of socialism. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please leave comments about your suggestions, perhaps your own Eingarben to myself, um, and please to, um, leave comments about improvement and what I can work on with this series. I'll also leave all my sources in the description in case you want to do any more further reading on the topic. This is truly a fascinating subject which is just not talked about enough in our spaces. With that said, I hope you enjoyed it and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye guys.